Through thinking, you cannot be aware of the, those spaces between words. Because thinking is object consciousness. The space between words is, takes you to space consciousness. So the entire secret of our gathering here of all spirituality is just one thing. All the things that happen, your financial situation, your health situation, your relationship situation, your work situation, your living situation. Yes, these things matter, relatively speaking, but there's one thing that is more important, that matters absolutely, and that is your state of consciousness. And whether or not you have awakened to what we could call, it sounds a little abstract, but it's not, we could call the transcendent dimension of consciousness in you. The transcendent dimension of consciousness. Now, I'm not going to immediately define what that means because actually it cannot be defined. It can be pointed to, this is what these words are for, but these words are not a substitute for it. The words point. Famous phrase in Buddhism, it's the finger pointing to the moon. But the finger is not the moon. So there's nothing that I say tonight that you need to believe on a conceptual level. I'm not asking you to believe anything whatsoever. There is what I sometimes call the, the two levels of consciousness, the conceptual. I sometimes call that object consciousness. These are all the things that happen in your perceptual field and in your mental field, thinking, emotions, sense perceptions. Things arise, things pass away, things come and go, sense perceptions, ideas, thoughts, opinions, feelings, emotions, all belong to object consciousness. One object after another happens. You, you perceive things, ah, oh, there, oh. And then thought objects arise continuously, a stream of thoughts. Oh, no, no. No, for most people, the stream of th thoughts has such a gravitational pull that they get dr completely dragged along by this continuously proliferating stream of mental activity. I sometimes call it the voice in the head. It never stops speaking. It continuously comments on where you are, what you're doing, or takes you somewhere completely different in the so-called past or the so-called future. One thing after another, one damn thing after another, to paraphrase Churchill. Churchill was talking about history. History is just one damn thing after another, and that's true, but for many people, their conditioned mind, the experience of their conditioned mind is just one damn thing after another because it never leaves you alone. It goes. So most humans who are not awakened or even awakening are completely trapped in their object consciousness. They are confined by it, and not only that, they are completely identified with all the arising thoughts and emotions that continuously go through their mind. And there's no separation between the thoughts and the emotions that accompany the thoughts. And you, you don't, you're not even there. 
when you're totally identified with the voice in the head, you are, spiritually speaking, asleep. Or another word for it is unconscious. So an unconscious person, in ordinary usage, unconscious means, of course, you've completely lost, you don't know what's going on, and this is unconscious. In conventional usage, unconscious means, in spiritual usage, unconscious means completely and continuously identified with a stream of thinking and the emotions that go with a stream of thinking. What does it mean to be identified? It means you derive your sense of who you are from, every, from the stream of thinking. Every thought is imbued with a sense of self. So you're identified, it gets, it, it, it has you in its grasp. And therefore, if you say, people conventionally say, I think, I think, what do you think? As if thinking for most people were a voluntary activity, whereas for most, not you, but those who are not awakening yet, which is the majority of the population still on the planet, for most, that is, they are completely identified with the stream of thinking. They are, spiritually speaking, unconscious. And that is a terrible thing because then everything that you perceive, reality itself as you perceive it, goes through the filter of your mental emotional conditioning from the past. So you never see anything as it is, perceive anything clearly, and most importantly, there is never a sense of inner, true inner peace, spaciousness, joy, sense of aliveness, sense of connectedness with something that is deeper than your historical person. You're always at the mercy of what goes on out there and the reactive patterns of your mind. So you're completely unaware of the possibility of realizing the other dimension of consciousness, which is not object consciousness, but space consciousness. I call it sometimes space consciousness. Now, what is space consciousness? You cannot define it because it's beyond concepts. You can know what space consciousness is in this very moment by becoming aware of the gaps between words when I speak. I'm just slowing down a little bit. So, instead of being totally interested in the words, you're also interested, although that's probably not the right word, you're also giving attention to the empty spaces between the words because they are needed. Without the spaces, there could be no sounds. The sound needs the space to exist. Oh, that's interesting. To be aware of the gaps between words. Or, in this room, in this hall, to be aware not only of the objects in this room, the objects that make up this room, what's in it, the bodies, the objects, that which confines and defines the room, the ceiling, the walls, the floor, this is the room. You're not only aware of that, that would be in this analogy object consciousness, you're also aware of the space in this room. Now the space isn't something that you say, oh, it's there, 
or it's there. But it is the most important part about, of this room is the space. And it's a wonderful space, but you cannot define it. It has no actual, you can't even say that space exists. Because exist means to manifest, to stand out. Exist, ex means out from Latin. Exist means to be manifested. But space does, is not, doesn't manifest, it enables everything to manifest in the physical realm. Without space, these things could not be here. So in, space is prior to existence. Space is prior to manifestation. And that's very interesting. So there is something in you, which I sometimes call space consciousness, that is prior to who you are as a person, your personality. And you can know it, not conceptually, but immediately and experientially by becoming aware either of the spaciousness outside of you or becoming aware of spaces between sounds, spaces between words. Now, how do you do that? How do you become aware of a space between two words? There is no how, because it's too simple for how. Quite simply, there's, a, there's an attention in you, a field of alert attention. And this field of alert attention is aware of the space between words. It, you notice that silent space. What does it mean to notice that silent space? It means in this brief moment of noticing, or noticing the space in this room, in this brief moment, you're not thinking, you're just aware. Thinking, you, through thinking, you cannot be aware of the, those spaces between words, because thinking is object consciousness. The space between words is, takes you to space consciousness. So the entire secret of our gathering here of all spirituality is just one thing. <laughs> now, amazingly, I'm going to talk about this one thing for hours. <laughs> Using different pointers. Also, perhaps, as you might have noticed, I haven't prepared anything, so I say perhaps because I don't know exactly what I'm going to speak about, but I assume I will also be speaking about the obstacles to this realization. This is very helpful to address the obstacles that may and probably will arise in you to the realization of that transcendent dimension of consciousness, which is the most important thing, this realization, the most important thing that you can, that can happen in your life. It's not even, ha happen is the wrong word. The most important thing in your life is to connect with that depth dimension. Because without that, even if you don't fully awaken whatever that is, but to have, a, to have an inner connectedness with something that transcends the personality or the historical person. The, the historical person that you are has its place, it's fine. You, 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 I mean, you have to live with yourself on that level. And it's problematic. Every person is problematic. Every person's life is problematic although you might not know this if you read people's Facebook posts, because they're, they're all doing great. 
and they all, they're all looking so happy. And they're all eating their wonderful meals and you have to shake it. And they look, they look all so beautiful because the pictures are so overexposed, like the, fo like the photo on the front cover of the magazine. <laughs> they, the photos are so overexposed that they, everybody looks so ethereal and beautiful. All that's left is you see the eyes and just a little bit of blurry outline of the face, but that's all. You don't know whether they're 20 years old or 60, you wouldn't know. <laughs> so that's... But life, the, the people have a mental construct of their, what their life is. One is that project into the world through modern technology. And then you have another mental construct that you live with in your life that you call me and my life. Me and my life. That's the person talking. That's the personality talking. So. And when you start questioning people, or you listen to people, or listen to your own, the voice in your own head talking about me and my life. Hmm. It's uh, not the greatest story. It's a problematic story. It's not easy being me. In fact, I don't think Anybody is having a more difficult time than me, and I need to think about that a bit more. How can I, how can I solve this this dilemma of me, this conundrum? This I am, I am. It's amazing that many people consider themselves without verbalizing it in that way. They consider themselves to be problem, a problem to be solved. <laughs> there's, there's something, and this is very interesting, there's something in the human psyche, if you are not awakening at all yet, so in the normal state of consciousness or unconsciousness, there's something there, there's, there's always either in the background or in the foreground, if it's in the background, there's a sense of unease, a sense of uh, something is missing, something is lacking. And what it is that's missing, perhaps the mind will figure out, okay, what I need to be fulfilled is this, that, that, that. Or the mind might not even know, because whenever you achieve something that you think will f liberate you from this permanent sense of uh, insufficiency, then whenever you think you found it, it doesn't take long, and then you say, oh no, because something, there's something else goes wrong there too. There's a new relationship, there's a new work situation, there's a new living situation. So there's often you deceive yourself, you say, no, I found the answer to the dilemma of me. I'm, not lib I'm liberated now because I have found the partner that I've been looking for, the one. I have found the one. And this delusion lasts for a little while. We don't know how long it could last for a year, um, probably less. You can see when you see when you look to anything for let's use this this almost spiritual term salvation, because you're really looking to something out there to, for salvation, salvation through a deeply satisfying relationship, permanently satisfying, salvation through some kind of acquisition of something adding to your life, salvation through moving to a totally different country or place, salvation through recognition from other people. Once, once people recognize me as when I become famous, oh, then I'll be fully myself. Then I will have found salvation. But all these people 
when they find those things, this, it doesn't take long. Let take relationships. You go out, you go dating. I don't know if they still do it these days. Dating, maybe dating is old-fashioned because everything happens on the phone. <laughs> Tinder swiping. <laughs> and then you have a you have a f date. When you go to a restaurant, you can see, you can immediately see with a couple sitting, whether a couple has been together already for quite a while, or whether they're only meeting for the first, second, or third time. We're dating. The others are not dating. They're already living together. Totally different energy field. Because the ones who are dating, they still are under the delusion that they found salvation through the other person. <laughs> And you can, you can, when you observe people, you can see it, the way they look at each other, they're both in a state of hypnosis, because they go... <laughs> so wonderful. And, and you don't even know that you're, un you're playing a role unconsciously and the other person is playing their role and you, the, these two roles interact and you think, well, this is the reality. And, that, and then you see another couple, they obviously have been together for a while and they kind of, they sit there. And most likely these days they are on their phones. <laughs> so they're already living together. No, and so when the dating goes to the next stage, you start moving in together, then ho these days it often happens before the wedding, if there if even is a wedding. But So you move in together and you quickly notice that this person is not the same person that you dated. <laughs> One soon after a few days or weeks, sometimes months, but that's maximum, you find, who is this person? You, there are suddenly uh, aspects of the personality that you find deeply uh, irritating, <laughs> if not disturbing. <laughs> and then you question yourself, say, I must have made a mistake. But it could also be that your partner feels the same thing about you. What happened? Well, so you're experiencing the, a conditioned personality. You're no longer experiencing a, a, a part that somebody is playing. You experience the conditioning of this, the, the person. And every person is, if you live with them for a little while, everybody, you will display behavior that is not that pleasant. They also have a pain body. If you've read my books and talks, you know what a pain body is. And we, we may talk about it later. It's an, an accumulation of past emotional pain that lives in you, but it's, it's, it's dormant. And then after a while it becomes active because it needs to feed on some kind of drama. And when you start living with somebody, and for the first time you experience this person's pain body when suddenly there's a shift in the entire energy field of that person. It's no longer the same person at all. It's a dreadful thing. And you don't know what it is. You say, oh, well... And that's how... Um, somebody wrote an article a while ago in the paper that says um, why you why you married the wrong person. So in that sense, <laughs> it's not pessimistic, but it sounds pessimistic, you always marry the wrong person. <laughs> Un unless, <laughs> unless some, you awaken to a deeper dimension in yourself that transcends the conditioned personality, then you have something more, something genuine, something that is not part of the conditioned entity that we call the person or the personality. 
Without that, the state of insufficiency, of lack, of not enough, of something missing, but you don't know what, or you think you know what, but it, that's not it, you can never get rid of it. So if you remain trapped in the, in your, in the, in the mental conditional, the, the, the conditioned energy field of the personality, then you are condemned to perpetual um, dissatisfaction, to put it mildly, or to use an even more generic term, unhappiness. That's a, that's a translation of a generic term that the Buddha used when he used the term dukkha, which can be translated, is usually translated as suffering, but in more generic terms it's, it means unhappiness, misery, um, unease. Well, let's stay with unhappiness in whatever form. So you're condemned to that every situation turns into eventually the, something turns up to mar the situation in some way, whether it's a person or a place or an activity or something that you, that you that you add to your life that you obtain. There's always something, and that's in the nature of things. But it only happens, and that's a, the positive part of the Buddha's teaching is never really spoken of because he doesn't want you to believe in something. So whatever you, whatever happens, there's always something that goes wrong, so to speak. But that's not a pessimistic statement. That is that only applies if you are dependent for your sense of well-being, your sense of who you are, if you are dependent on all those external factors for your sense of who you truly are, your sense of identity, your sense of well-being. Because nothing can satisfy you for long. And that's, if you leave it at that, it sounds a little pessimistic or nihilistic. Okay, so what's the point in anything, says the person who superficially studies Buddhism or other teachings. So if nothing can satisfy, what's the point in anything? I might as well get drunk and then experience the briefly that and then in the next hangover and then get drunk again and then eventually I'll kill myself. <laughs> but that's all, that is only the first part. He says, if you seek yourself in all those things that you think will bring you salvation, if you seek yourself in those things of the world that the world offers, then you will be unhappy. But now the unspoken part is, but if you find yourself in the formless realm of transcendent consciousness, then the world is actually no longer such a bad place because you don't look to the world, which means other people, achievements, situations and places and acquisitions. You don't look to the world for completion of your sense of identity. You don't seek yourself anymore in the things of this world. Then the things of the world are no longer as frustrating as they were before. And you can allow things to be, you can participate in the play of form, in manifesting. You can even enjoy relationships because you are no longer looking for completion of your sense of self through those things. So why are you no longer looking for completion of your sense of self through those things? Because you have, you have found yourself not in the realm of object consciousness, not in the realm of thought or sensory perception, you have found a deeper dimension 
within yourself, which we call temporarily space consciousness. I also sometimes call it the deep I. Uh, by that I don't mean this I, it's a pronoun first. I, I am. The deep I as opposed to the surface I. Now, this, the two of you exist. Well, the deep I doesn't really exist. It, it's a prior to existence that you have both in you. But most humans are only aware of the surface I. And that's a terrible deprivation that really is a non-fulfillment, permanent sense of non-fulfillment with brief interludes of deluded fulfillment. Like you can have a have a great sensory gratification through you, you have a wonderful meal and then you feel okay I'm really fulfilled now. Well okay the body is full and for a moment or you can drink, you can take in some substances and you have brief moments of ah a substance, whatever can brief can can free you of yourself briefly too. Oh, but I don't recommend it. But I can see why people and millions of all over the world are longing and many cannot live without some substance. There's an enormous pull, an enormous longing. What is it that they experience when they take this substance, whether it's alcohol or other things? <clears throat> they experience briefly, <clears throat> never lasts, a sense of self-transcendence. So the substance can briefly free you of yourself this mind-made thing that you live with, this problematic sense of I, this problematic me and my life. Oh dear, how am I going to solve this problem? Well, you can't. So alcohol can briefly free you because you drink, take a few drinks and you feel lighter for a while. Ah. Because it slows down your mind. It, you can't think that much anymore. Uh, and because you, you can't think that much anymore, life becomes somewhat less problematic. <laughs> because if you don't remember your problems, they're gone. All you're left with is immediate situations that you either deal with or you don't deal with. But the, the place where your problems live is in your mind, and they only exist if you think about them. Of course, they refer to situations, that is true. But every situation can only be experienced or faced or solved or simply accepted in the present moment. Nothing ever arises in your life that's not in the present moment. So the rest and the present moment you can deal with. It's just here and now. Either you take action or you don't. But this is the present moment. But then you have a whole superstructure of the problematic, my problematic life that lives in your mind. And that's an incredible burden to live with. And everybody lives with this burden if they have not awakened to the deeper dimension of the, the deep eye. They, they are trapped in their surface eye. It's a, it's a terrible prison. I can sometimes watch people how they are they are trapped in their personality and everything they say and every, the way they perceive things is totally to colored by the conditioning of their mind. They, and they are, they are identified with every thought that comes into their head. If you, if you just question something, an opinion, they express an opinion you, and you say, no, I don't think that's right. And you give, they immediately get defensive or aggressive or ang angry or uh, and sometimes people get violent when you when you doubt their opinions they know you're wrong wrong people sometimes kill each other because they, they, they can't agree on a subject why because you you derive your sense of identity from thought 
or an opinion is a thought or a group of thoughts in your mind that you identify with when you identify with it, it becomes part of the ego. So we're talking here, of course, I haven't used the word so far. We are talking about egoic consciousness. When you identify it with thought completely, you are in egoic consciousness. The ego is operating in you and it pretends to be you. And you do, so you are, spiritually speaking, asleep. You are a totally conditioned entity. And so every opinion that you have, anybody should question it. That this person is questioning your very sense of identity. And that's how you react. You feel threatened in your sense of identity. It's, it's an absurd delusion, but millions live like that. So th the identification with mental positions is a very important part of the egoic consciousness. Now, does this mean as you awaken to the deeper levels, the, the transcendent dimension, does that mean you no longer have any opinions? No, it doesn't. You continue to have opinions and, of course, thoughts also. But you do not derive your sense of who you are from those thoughts or opinions. Why? Do you, do, do you no longer derive your sense of who you are from those thoughts? Because you have found something much more real, much more fundamental than any thought that tells you who you are. A, th a thought is, by the analogy I often use, is a ripple on the surface of the ocean. You as a personality, and the personality consists of uh, the conditioning of your mind. You're like a ripple on the surface of the ocean, and you exist as this ripple. Um, some ripples are bigger than others, but it doesn't make that much difference. Uh, some ripples are even waves. They might have a private jet. So they have a, there's, a, there's a wave, I'm a wave, I'm not a ripple on the surface of the ocean. And so, so the, the ripple considers, it looks at other ripples and feels uneasy and it's never complete. And deep down it knows that its existence is short-lived. So it, it hopes to become a little bigger ripple by looking to the future, because if I get this, that and that, I'll be a bigger ripple. But it also knows deep down that the future that it looks to for fulfillment will eventually kill it too. So the future is a two-edged sword. It promises fulfillment, and, but it re really will kill you. That's time. Well, we, we are all suffering as a physical entity. We are all suffering, of course, from that disease. Uh, the, uh, the prognosis is not good because we all have this virus called time and it's already consuming our bodies. And you don't have to wait long and finally it kills you. They haven't found a remedy yet against time. So the ripple lives an uneasy existence on the surface of the ocean, looking for some kind of completion and fearing other ripples or wanting to use other ripples. Come, let's join. We, the two together become kind of bigger ripple but it probably won't work. And then let's say the ripple in a moment of complete dissatisfaction with life, when it says nothing makes sense anymore, it finally comes to a stop in its incessant search for fulfillment. And it comes to a stop in its incessant doing and looking to the next moment for some kind of fulfillment. And the ripple for a moment stops and but it doesn't stop because it has taken, I don't know if this analogy still works if I continue with the ripple, but <laughs> I talked about transcending a sense of self through taking in a substance. It frees you from a moment from this in sense of insufficiency. This, the, the ripple feels a little bit better and just taken something and you don't, doesn't think about his problems anymore. Ah, 
It doesn't always work because sometimes it can awaken the pain body. Certain substances like alcohol can awaken your pain body, in which case, because it, it, it lowers your level of consciousness to, to, to an even lower level than your normal level. Not, I'm not talking to you personally. It, it lowers your level when you drink, lowers your level of consciousness to an even lower than the normal level, and then this gives the pain body an opportunity to completely take you over. But with other people, they become temporarily quite happy when they, when they drink or t take other substances. You can smoke. It slows down your mind. It goes, oh, and it feels so good. Your problem, the, the whole substruct, superstructure of problems begins to subside because you're not thinking about the problems. Therefore, they disappear. Ah. So there, you, have, you have glimpses of self-transcendence and that's why people feel drawn to it. Because without knowing it, people are longing to become free of themselves. They, are, they don't know it, but there is a longing and this is built into the evolution of the, of the human being. This longing for self-transcendence is built into the, uh, the evolution of human consciousness. Every human experiences it, but they look for it, to, for a solution to this longing on, in the wrong ways, in the completely wrong places.